Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly ointment, of pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. The Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box he used to take what was put into it. And Jesus said, let her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
because the Romans are now paying attention too. Someone must stop this rabble-rousing rabbi. They have to do something about it. Now, the people may be wondering if Jesus is coming to the Passover celebration that is just a, a few days away now. But instead, the elites of Jerusalem have put out in all points bulletin what modern law enforcement would call a bolo. Be on the lookout. For Jesus. He's a dangerous man. He must do something to stop what's going on. It made it dangerous for Jesus to move around. The question was being asked. What's going to happen? Will Jesus be at Passover? Now, of course, while that conversation is going on, Jesus shows up. At a dinner party. I mean, after all, a dinner party. What did we hear last week? That Jesus was a party guy? Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Lazarus are putting together a dinner party for Jesus. And they gather at the house to share a meal. Breaking bread together like the community does. Remembering all that God had done and is continuing to do in their presence. There's much to celebrate. For Lazarus is alive. And then something interesting happens. As the dinner crowd is gathered around at the table, reclining there. That's kind of how they would have done it back then. Kind of reclining back in their, and well, maybe not even a chair. Maybe just a pillow. At a low table. Mary, Lazarus' sister, comes up and does something kind of curious. She takes some very, very expensive ointment and rubs it on Jesus' feet and then takes her hair and wipes it off. Kind of curious. Why would, why would she be doing this? Now, in the Synoptic Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have three examples each of Jesus telling the disciples precisely what was going to happen. He had predicted his own death. And if you look in John's Gospel, those predictions aren't quite so clear. So, what is it? That they have, that they have Mary interested in doing something that perhaps would be fitting for one who is to be buried. And that is exactly what's going on. Mary is preparing Jesus for his birth. Now you might think, well, he's been out walking on the street, Pastor. This, how is this a, an anointing for burial? I mean, we all know that the streets of Jerusalem, and in fact, many towns of that time would have been a little more than open sewers. His feet must have stunk, right? That's exactly why it is that Jesus is having his feet anointed by the woman. No, not so much. The word, indeed, has gotten around. Well, I can imagine, perhaps, folks have figured out what the challenge was. I mean, Caiaphas himself had told the crowd gathered around him the idea that obviously what will have to happen. It is better for you, Caiaphas says, that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. And Jesus earlier, of course, in John's Gospel, had alluded to the idea that he would raise the temple on the third day. Destroying the temple, bringing it down, and then raising it up on the third day. The people who heard what Jesus said were, were hard to believe exactly what it was that he said. They were incredulous in his words. And instead, Jesus is referring to himself. It was his body, that temple, that he would raise on the third day. And so now Mary is preparing with some expensive nard. 300 denarii we hear. 
the whole year's wage for the average person of Jesus' day. So clearly, this was an expensive thing. Mary's love and devotion to Jesus is being clearly revealed. Her love for her Savior shown in the delicate care with which she treats him. But one, one of Jesus' disciples standing by witnesses this and, and kind of scolds Mary. What are you doing, Mary? That's expensive stuff. You're just wiping it on his feet. Really? We could have taken that money and given it to the poor. Now, normally, of course, we're told that not to, uh, at least one of our, our professors at seminary would suggest, never psychologize the text. Read more into it, perhaps, than is actually there. But in this case, Scripture actually reveals the questionable motives of the speaker in our text. Judas is scary. <clears throat> for he is the one holding the purse. The poor, the money for the poor that has been collected and will be delivered. As well as the resources of the entire community in this purpose. But obviously there are some challenges, some integrity issues for the Judas. <clears throat> but Jesus. Son of God knows the heart of Mary. He told Jesus. No, no. Let her alone, he says. Let her keep this woman, for she can use it for my burial. And she, then Jesus is making it clearer now for all who's gathered at the table. Yes, indeed, the poor you will always have, but you will not always have me. The point is that Mary is preparing Jesus just as he had said. She is anointing him with love and care. She is worshiping Jesus for the Lord. Now, of course, what is it that Jesus means by this idea that the poor you will always have, but you will not always have me? Is in fact what happening here is that Jesus is giving us some excuse to kind of throw our hands up and not worry about the poor in, in our communities? It's clearly God's will. Jesus said so. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that expression. But that's not what he means. Instead, what we really see is a foreshadowing of what's coming. We know what's coming up the road. Yes, Jesus will enter into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey on Palm Sunday, triumphantly, with the support of the crowd and the people. For the rest of the week, you know, it goes precisely according to God's will. Jesus is offering up Himself, not just for His disciples, not just for Israel, but we know earlier in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Christ will die on the cross very soon. And no, they will not always have Him in their presence as He is there before them. But that doesn't mean that we should forget about the poor or accept their plight as inevitable either. Mary is focused upon Jesus while she has Him in her midst. That's her worship is focused on Him. And we know that Jesus is actually quoting in some ways Deuteronomy 15, 11, where Moses teaches the people of God to open their hands wide to the needy and the poor in the land. The reality is that as long as we have Christ, we will have the poor. You might ask, what does that mean? What are you saying, Pastor? Having Christ as central to our lives moves us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Without Christ, our motives wander and our focus is on ourselves, not on the needs of others. I mean, we just said it a minute ago, right? We confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. what we 
we are, we are remembering. That Jesus went to the cross because we could not overcome our focus on self by ourselves. But that we were in need of Him who is our prophet, our priest, and our king. In Matthew 25, of course, Jesus is telling the disciples and the crowd around him, that as long as you do unto the least of these, you are doing it. And what that it is, is a great many things. Caring, loving, serving, feeding, listening, and when we do it to the least of them in our midst, we do it as unto Christ. Mary was humbly and extravagantly worshiping Jesus. She was putting her treasure where her heart is. We might ask ourselves, what does that look like for us? Paul put it pretty well in his letter to the Romans. In chapter 12, he writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies. Really, you can almost see it. I had to amplify, but I don't know what it says in there. But you can almost say, your whole selves, your whole life, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That, that is our spiritual worship. Living lives of self-sacrifice as Christ has called us to do. As Christ models for us on the cross. So as we give of ourselves in our time and in our talents and indeed even in our treasure, we worship the Lord. Helping folks move, building ramps, boat, food and clothing drives. 30, 39. 39! Uniforms for school children. Did you ever think about that? That we make distinctions sometimes between worship and service? Is it possible? Is it possible indeed that what we do in those moments are every bit as much worship as what we do here in this room on Sunday morning? And of course we do these things. Because Christ center in our lives by the gift of faith, a gift of the Holy Spirit. Knowing what it is that He has done for us. I mean, you have to understand that's perhaps behind this dinner that Jesus is attending with Bethany in the first place. Jesus had raised their brother from the dead. He is alive. Let us celebrate. Well, this is still lit, so I don't want to go too far down that road. But we know where it is and what's coming. The good news, the gift of joy that we have, and the knowledge of the salvation that He shares with us. And that calls for a response of love and de devotion. The same kind of love and devotion that Mary witnesses for us today in our gospel. Just like today, Jesus has invited us to a dinner party where He is present again to remember what He has done for us. He is present again. This is the foretaste of that feast that we look forward to, the feast yet to come. We are fed and nourished with word and sacrament. We take our devotion and our worship of Christ out into the world to put our treasures, our time, and our talents where our hearts are. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's take a moment to reflect on God's word and his will for our lives.